We are back on the KSO show. Mason Voth, Derek Young from K-State Online here and ready to go to preview the Wildcats and the Cougars, the game of the weekend for K-State as they continue to keep themselves moving at the same pace as uh, most of the other schools in the Big 12. I think uh, we're sitting at like four or five schools that have one loss or less, and everybody thinks that they have a chance to be in Arlington still. Is K-State one of those teams? Last week, they still proved that they might be. They get another opportunity to just take care of business with a lesser-than opponent in Houston at home this weekend. And so we'll have to see what the Wildcats do there because if they can win this weekend, it sets up a massive matchup next weekend in Austin. Last time for the foreseeable future that K-State will be facing Texas, and it could have massive Big 12 title game implications. And I'm sure everybody would love nothing more than to see K-State get a win down there, especially if it means K-State is in Arlington, Texas is blocked out. But that is next week because the Cats have to take care of business against the Cougars at home this weekend. Houston has proven to be a little bit friskier than some would anticipated in the Big 12. Really, they had the win on the Thursday night against West Virginia that was significant, and then they battled with Texas. But if you look around, they were beat up pretty bad by TCU and Texas Tech at various points this year. So, it's a mixed bag on Houston. You never know what you're going to expect. Offensively, though, they can come out and hang with you pretty early on. So we'll start with uh, just a, some general thoughts on the Cougars as K-State welcomes Donovan Smith and Dana Holgerson back to Manhattan in different uniforms for the first time. Yeah, I agree with the assessment that they're just kind of a frisky club. They'll, they'll hang around a little bit, mostly because they can they can keep up on the scoreboard. They got a quarterback that can be dangerous both with his arm and his legs. And Donovan Smith, Kansas State, has seen a lot of him, even though it was in a different uniform at the time. They got some receivers that are that are pretty dangerous as well. So, you know, Houston's good enough on offense where they can keep up. My, you know, suspicions or instincts going into this, and I'll, I'll just get this off the top. I, you know, I wonder if they're out of gas. I really do because they, they they had the emotional high of the West Virginia win where they literally won on a Hail Mary in the last play of the game, essentially. And then the week thereafter, which was last week, they had the emotional low where they, they literally empty the tank as much as they can to try to defeat Texas in their lone meeting of where they'll get to face the Longhorns at home, and they come up just short. So – from a mental standpoint, just how much gas do they have? I imagine they're running on fumes. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you on that. I just think that they've put a lot into the last couple of weeks and getting themselves into this position. And, you know, you, you start to to think, hey, well, maybe things are turning around for us. But it's just tough, the, what they've had to go through the last couple right. of weekends. And, uh, I mean, that, that West Virginia game in itself takes a lot out of you as a team because there were so many ups and downs in it. And it was a true, like, you're playing all 60 minutes. And then, yeah, Texas, like, they were down 21. So you're exerting extra effort in that game, too, because you start down 21 nothing, and you do enough to claw all the way back and have the game tied and maybe give yourself a chance. And ultimately, Texas got the win. So I think emotions have been up and down and tested a lot over the last couple of weeks. And then, obviously, the physical side of it. And uh, a road trip at K-State might just be a really tough thing to try and overcome. Uh, if you're Houston this weekend. Yeah, it certainly feels like that. And, th and then on the flip side, you say, does Kansas State have a letdown spot here? You just smacked TCU by 38, and you you could be caught looking ahead to Texas the following week. That's certainly an angle to play. It's certainly an angle to consider. I would – maybe this is the homer in me, the bias in me, right? Um, you know, get my purple power cat ready here. But <laughs> it, it just feels like Kansas State probably has already learned that lesson when they admitted that they probably took – they didn't take Oklahoma State seriously enough. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I just – K-State is not going to be in the position to do that anymore. At least I would hope not. If they do, they've got they've got serious problems that would have prevented them from getting to Arlington anyways, if that's the mindset and the thought process. Because I don't think you can go out and look as bad and as flat as you did against Oklahoma State and now show up in every other game this year thinking, all right, yep, we got this cakewalk. Here we go. We're fine. I think that's the kind of game where 
it's never good to lose, but if you are going to lose a game, it's probably best that you take something out of it like that where you look and say, if you're K-State, man, we let a lot of opportunities slip and we played terrible and we didn't take this game seriously. Like We just have to come out focused and locked in and we can hang with anybody. And so I think that should be the thought and the message moving forward. And that's why even if Houston battles and K-State doesn't play their best game on Saturday, K-State should be able to beat a team like Houston when – Houston plays at this level and K-State's playing at this one just a little below it because K-State is better as a team. And I think as long as you have that focus, that is the most important part so many times in college football when you're playing an opponent that is lesser than you. And that's what K-State has this weekend. So the focus should be there. And if it's not, this team is in a lot bigger of a hole than we would have anticipated even after the Oklahoma State game. I think I think losing this game at Houston, now this probably makes a lot of sense to people, so it's not like I'm going out on some big limb uh, because Houston is a is obviously a worse team than Oklahoma State right now, and it would be a home game. But if K-State were to lose this game for as bad and meltdown-y as it felt after the Oklahoma State game, this one should feel even worse than that because there's no excuse going into this game for being able to get surprised by Houston. They you know what they are, you know what they're going to do, and you should be able to handle your business if you're K-State. Absolutely. And and think about their losses now. I knew at the time people were melting down. And, and this is not to excuse losing those two games, but Missouri and Oklahoma State are a combined 12-3. and three. Yeah. Right? That's that's no joke. They, they are certain for, for, for the folks that did melt down through those losses. I'm not coming after you. But you do have to consider that both of those teams are a bit better than you probably thought at the time and what contributed to your meltdown. On the flip side of that, on another – I keep saying flip side. I don't know. But uh, Houston, one of the four newcomers, and, and this kind of goes into the running out of gas angle that I'm kind of taking here. You wonder if those teams start to fall off even more as the season goes on because they are not used to this kind of grind. No, and that's – I mean, I, we'll, we've got plenty they of basketball. that. Right? We got plenty of basketball season in front of us, but that's the thing that I'm most fascinated in seeing, mainly from Houston. Like I, we all think that Houston is still going to be good as a basketball number, team this number year. Number two in the Ken Palm, right? Yeah, yeah. like they, they're still going to be awesome, really good. But let's see how you handle playing 18 games twice a week in the Big 12, because I think that's going to wear you down a lot quicker and faster than the American when, oh man, we just played a – our one tough game of the year on the road at Memphis or, you know, no, oh, well, you know, gonna, Tulane's a little gonna, tricky this year. What about the Shockers? No, no, no God, no, uh, no, not the Shockers. Uh, but you <laughs> I, know, had like, I, had I know, I know, I know. Anytime that we talk American athletic conference, we got to talk about the Shockers because everybody knows I hate them. Um, but like, if you look at this Houston and basketball this year, it's going to be, Boom, Kansas. Boom, Texas. Boom, whoever. And then you're like, all right, whew, that three-game stretch is behind, it, behind us. Now we get Oklahoma State. And look, Mike Boynton, nice guy. Probably not a good basketball coach, but playing Oklahoma State is not an easy test for anybody in the Big 12. Now, most schools come out with a win, but we've also seen a lot of good teams like KU, like Baylor, whoever, go to gallagher Iba and drop that game and be shocked. Or, I mean, think about TCU. TCU is one of those teams in the Big 12 in basketball that, like, yeah, most of the time you would you would hope and expect to get a win from them. But if you're not ready, they can beat you, like what they're, TCU did at, at KU last year. So, and they're growing. And they're yeah. growing. So I TCU. Think, people have TCU ahead of K-State this year. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't do that. I mean, I, TCU's been in the league for a decade now, and they still haven't won you know, more than nine games in a league schedule, so let's pump the brakes there. But yeah. – that's, I mean, that's what I think about Big 12 basketball. It's got to be the same for football. I mean, last year, here is how Houston at this point in the season, who who their opponents were: South Florida at SMU, Temple at East Carolina, and versus Tulsa. They finished at home. So, and they went. I mean, that stretch they went three and two. They lost to SMU and and Tulsa last year. They got beat seventy seven to sixty three last year by SMU. Uh, that's just nuts. So, so. That like grind, it's going to catch up to you. And those results came off of a stretch last season where they lost in overtime to Tulane. They won by a point at Memphis. They were on the road at Navy and they had the USF game. They started to wear down. Like all that started to take a toll on them. And I just think you're going to get that even more 
And yep. especially that Houston team last year ended up winning eight games. This K State team, this Houston team this year, they're facing a K State team that might win eight games, but Houston certainly is not going to win eight this year. So the talent is not there, and you're playing better talent, and you are playing just a grind. And these road trips, you are going to places that none of these guys outside of like Donovan Smith have truly experienced before. And maybe that's a benefit is that Donovan Smith has been here in the past in, in Manhattan. But I just I, I think that K State should be able to wear Houston down and. We'll talk about it a little later in the game in the show about how the game goes. But I think you and I both agree that this is one of those games where K State is probably going to score at will, and Houston might score a lot too. But K State's going to be able to outpace Houston. It's going to be an arm's length type of game, I think, similar to the game that Donovan Smith played last year for Texas Tech, where K State ends up winning by like nine. Felt like it was under control for the most part, although Tech did tie it at 20 to start the fourth quarter, but then K-State pulled away. So I think it's probably something similar to that. I would agree with that. Now, the one newcomer that might not be, I guess, I want to say stunned, you know, the shock to the system when it comes to that grind getting worn down might be BYU because they, look, their independent schedule wasn't like Notre Dame. But there was periods of their schedule where they're playing power five team after power five team. Yeah, that's that's a that's a fair point because I, I think they've they, they they've played experienced a lot of it. Yeah, yeah, they've experienced it and been through it before, and they've had games later in their season that have been tougher. But some of these others, and I would man, not really because most of those guys are gone. Like I was gonna throw Cincinnati in that boat, not because of who they've played, but like those teams that were trying to make the playoff they've had so much pressure on them from a standpoint of every week, you've got to win that game. Like any little slip up could doom you, but UCF and Cincinnati did both go undefeated. So I guess I can give them a little credit for that. I mean, right. UCF yeah. you know, they claimed that national championship. Right? Yeah. Well, I, Hey, I'll give it to them. Another big 12 uh, national champion out there. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let them have that if they want it. So we'll see. I, I think it's going to be a, uh, a fascinating showdown this weekend and, We'll just kind of wait and uh, take a take a pause throughout Saturday and and get a check of where the cats are at and how focused they seem. But I, I don't think that's going to be much of a problem given the circumstances that played out in Stillwater. The first quarter will tell us a lot. Yeah, and I mean we found out quite a bit really early on in the TCU game in the first quarter, and and what we found out was that K State was up to the challenge of just kicking TCU's butt. And I, and I think we found out a lot in the first quarter against Oklahoma State too, because it yeah. like it, I I, st I was pretty uneasy even after that first quarter. I, was like, I don't think they have it tonight. Did you uh, did you happen to to see or read any of what Sonny Dyke said after the game against K State? Embarrassed, embarrassed. <laughs> like that guy's pride took a, a monster hit after that game. I I maybe because he was so hungry to maybe redeem what happened in that big 12 championship game and then got his ass kicked anyway. But like that guy's soul looked like left his body after that game. So yeah, he used, he, he used the word embarrassed a lot. He also just kept repeating the phrase. Didn't see that one coming, which I, I think I said it on the boards at one point this week. It feels like since Chris Kleiman came to K state, they have at least one game every year where they make the opposing coach say something like that. Like, Obviously, it was Mike Gundy last season where he Lincoln just went, Lincoln Riley a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Lincoln Riley. He felt it a lot. Uh, <laughs> where you know, that didn't uh, Dave Aranda probably said it last year, yeah, something to, to the effect. Yeah, no, I feel like, yeah, maybe. I mean, that man, I didn't even think Baylor played bad that game. Like, no. I thought they played better than Oklahoma State did, obviously. Yeah, but, but that Baylor game was domination too. I mean, mm -hmm. that was. That was prime Will Howard last year. Like yeah. he was just bumming, dude. Yeah, I just it's it's kind of one of those things to reflect on that. Um, and it's the the point is this: like you're talking about watching the game early and being able to tell in the first quarter. Sonny Dykes made the comment. And he was asked, like, okay, like could you tell before the game or how did you feel? It's like no, like we practiced great all week and, and energy was great before the game. Like I felt everybody was really confident, felt good, and then the game started. Like. Just kind of one of those deals. I mean, last year, you think about it, honestly, M Missouri, Oklahoma State, and Baylor all probably have, like, the right to just go, yeah, did not see that one coming. Like, how bad and, and just and in your face it was. 
And to that end, like those are three dominating wins from last year. There might have been another one that was kind of decisive. Mm-hmm. Um, Texas Tech was sort of decisive. Like you still have like these multiple possession wins both last year and now this year. I mean, you clocked SEMO. Not, some of these are, are not good teams. You, you clocked SEMO by 45. You beat Troy by almost 30. You basically beat UCF by 20. If you take off the chief touchdown by Gus Malzahn, you beat Texas Tech by about 20. You beat TCU by about 40. Like none of their wins are close. <laughs> yeah. Well, so here's here's the one that I remember. This is Chris Kleiman's very first game at K-State. And this is this was when I was still working at, at the radio station. And so obviously we had John and Mitch that were going to go to Kleiman's press conference. And so what I got tasked with was going to the opposing coaches press conference, just so we had that audio in case we needed it. So the very first time I did that was with the great Tim Rebo, the uh, Nichols coach. And I just remember the first the first thing he said was anybody have some stats. I don't have anything to look at. I just know an ass whipping. <laughs> and like, like, like Kansas State's like I, I get it. They have two losses this year, and the one was an absolute dud of a performance against mm-hmm. Oklahoma State. Like Missouri, they didn't play great, but they didn't play bad against Missouri. Yeah. Missouri played pretty well. Um, it was just the crazy clock management at the end of that that game. But every other game, like Kansas State is, or like I think we lose sight of it sometimes because we're too close to it. Or our expectations are just sometimes so unmanageable, it's not fair. But, like, if we step back a little bit, and I did that a little bit this week, and that's why I wrote about it. Like, Kansas State is crushing teams. Like, this – Yeah. But like, it, like it's, it's kind of hard to fathom it. I mean, like, their closest games in the wins that they have, they're five and two. But in those five wins, they're close, what, 38-21 over Tech? If if you consider UCF a twenty point win, like yeah, sheesh, yeah, no, that it's it's a good point. I mean, I K State is doing a lot of good things, and the numbers bear that out. And that's why you look at you know what, what whatever Bill Connolly puts out there, or some other people with how they're ranking teams. And K State with those two losses, they're still pretty high because I think people look at it and they say, okay, that was a road game at Mizzou. You lost on a sixty what one yard, two yard field goal. And Mizzou's turned out to be a pretty solid team. And yep. then they see the Oklahoma State game for what it was. You played a dud on the road Friday night against a team that's better than we thought, but like you played your worst performance in that it game. Was, it was it was an absolute dud against a team that is much better than we thought. Yeah. And they still had a chance to tie it at the end of the game. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's what the game they played at Oklahoma State, they are going to play some games this year against teams that if you play that game against them, you would still have a chance to win. Like, I mean, you know, Houston is good, but they they're obviously not as good as Oklahoma State. The if home you play game that, is yeah, Houston and Baylor, Houston and Baylor. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. If you play that game that you did against Oklahoma State, and it plays out against Houston and Baylor, now notwithstanding those two games are at home, but you could put together that performance and still probably find a way to actually beat those teams with it. In Stillwater, they put together a performance that they were still able to come this close to doing it. They just weren't able, able to get over the hump and actually execute. So I think that's something to, to keep in mind watching the game this weekend. Uh, and that was a, a big, long, just, you know, undressing of K-State football this season to take it was a look a good, at. Yeah, that was a good first 19 minutes of the show. That's what I, that's yeah. what I like to All, but, all but downhill it, from here. Part of it's just sometimes we have to apply perspective and acknowledge – because we failed to do so sometimes yeah. just how good Kansas state's playing. They're playing good football. Like we want it to be perfect, <laughs> but they're playing really good football. I, I think that's a good point because I think what you said earlier too, like sometimes we're too close to it and we put, we'll put K state in a much loftier area than what they actually should be or what like we anticipate. And so we do that. And so then when they lose the game at Oklahoma state, we're like, how, how do you do that? Like you are better than that. And also, we're giving zero credit that Oklahoma State might be improved. And on the flip side, K-State will beat a team by two touchdowns, and we're like, well, could have been 24. Like, what are you doing? Like, you look like crap. Like, it, we want it especially, both ways. and Especially on the road. Yeah. Like, what they did in Lubbock, like, look, Texas Tech's probably going to melt down the rest of the year. But Kansas State didn't play a terrible team in Lubbock. They wouldn't won that yeah. game. Yeah, and I, I think – 
that's sports and fandom in general is like we're we're going to embellish and uh you know overstate how bad or good some things are and whenever you lose it's never a good thing which i like is 100% true and i think you look at it k-state's we're losses just, this year we're just K-State, yeah k-state's losses are bad for different reasons because here's here's how i look at it right now i mean this does not feel like a team obviously the the, the talent is lacking and it's not as good but if you look at the situation and compare K State's stretch right now to what TCU did last year, K State could very easily be in that TCU position where TCU last year in their you know skin of their teeth games they won them they came out on top and like last season obviously the Baylor game is the one that everybody remembers they ran out the field goal kicker at the very last minute and they won twenty nine to twenty eight um, they yep. survived they survived on the road in Lawrence when. Jason Bean played the entire second half. They had, you know, a, a, like some other tight ones in there. Uh, the Texas game was ugly. And now that's a good Texas team, but they survived their stinkers last year. They they team. overcame them. K State just did it this year. Yeah. And they're, they're, and what? they had the opportunity to. Yeah. They're, think about it this way you're two or three plays away from being seven and oh. And one of those plays is a 61 yard field. Yeah. And, and that's kind of what I'm saying. Like, it's just hey, that's, so that's, close to, to doing people, what you needed. Uh, Iowa fans would want to like just take a pitchfork and stab me with it from what I'm about to say because this is a this is a Kirk Ferentz phrase that that I, understandably that they're you know you know frustrated with and are tired of hearing. But one of his things, because I covered Kirk Ferentz for two years, he says that's football. But sometimes that's literally it. That's football. Yeah, yeah. and. That and that's that's how it's supposed to be. Like it, that's how sports in general are supposed to be. Where, you know, it, you've if just a few things go awry or the breaks don't go your way, it drastically changes things for you. And I mean, we've seen that. You know, well, obviously the best indicator of it is like what's going on in in the major league postseason right now. Like those series get flipped on their heads if any one little thing. Go that, against you. Yeah, I, I had some bad beats there, man. I needed the <laughs> I needed the Philly so bad. Like the Diamondbacks making it to the World Series, robbed me cold. That that's the the wounds are still fresh. Yeah, I mean, who would have who would have expected the Diamondbacks to be there? But I had a Phillies future. Oh, just right there. I and I th- I think if the Phillies had gotten back, they would have done it. Just because I think that you go back to back. Although what the Rangers did and it didn't work out for them, but if you get to back to back of them and you lost the first, I feel like you're going to probably get over the hump in yeah, the second. I, I will never forgive the Diamondbacks. Unforgivable sins by Arizona, who I am. Uh, I'm probably going to be pulling for just because I I'd like to see. Uh, no, happen. absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> I'm the biggest Texas Rangers fan in the country now. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's get it back on track in terms of Houston and K State this weekend. Uh, we know the weather is going to be crappy. We know that some other factors will play into it. What do you have confidence in K-State doing well? Like, what is going to work on Houston this weekend for K-State offensively and defensively? Is this going to be like one of those, like, Bill Snyder games where Kansas State throws it three times? Like, Well, I tell you, this <laughs> – this th- definitely feels like it's got the making if uh, people wanted to to make it like 2010 Texas. So uh, I'm sure you've heard enough about your time and your time at K State what that game was like for K State, where they only had nine passing yards the entire game, and Colin Klein was two of four passing for nine yards. K State beat Texas 39 to 14. Colin Klein ran for 127 and two touchdowns. Daniel Thomas ran for 106 and two touchdowns. And K-State totaled 261 on the ground that day. And uh, Texas couldn't do anything. Garrett Gilbert threw the ball 60 times with five picks, uh, if that interests you at all. K-State offensively, they could replicate that probably if they wanted. They have four guys that can run the ball successfully, and the weather is going to stink and be prime for running. I'm not saying that Saturday is going to be like that, but I'm not saying it's not going to be like that. Yeah. (laughs) I mean... It, it could be. It very well could be with the way that the weather is shaping up. And I think that's the benefit for K-State right now is, I mean, this is the you're getting to the time of the year where you could get some, some weather that impacts games, and their game is built for cold weather right now, especially offensively, because 
the the running the ball thing, like it was good already, but now it's just kind of blown up because you know we know about Avery Johnson getting infused in the offense now, but the fact that like the running backs have found their groove and, and are probably going to start to work even better together than what they already had, like that's a significant thing for K State. They're on the pace to break the school record for yards per carry. Like seriously, it's pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. I would I would not have guessed that. So. I mean, I, I look, that's, that's the way I'm going. Like it's, it's simple. It's easy. Everybody sees it, but Houston's also not very good against the run. Yeah, um, no, they're terrible against it, but the, that also makes teams are going to start selling out against the Kansas mm-hmm. state run. I'm not saying they're going to throw the ball a lot. I'm not going to say they're going to light up the stat sheet when it comes to throwing it, but there's going to be opportunities to be explosive in the passing game. And I think yeah. that they will capitalize on them. Yeah, and I I think you know one of the the over unders that Drew has for us this week was I think the leading receiver for K State it was seventy seven and a half passing well uh, receiving yards, and I just have wavered back and forth on if I think they go over or not because like we've seen obviously DJ Giddens has broken off just you know you toss a ball to him and he goes sixty yards and like you're saying the passing game is going to continue to be opened up more by teams trying to sell on the run. And I mean, you could hit a guy and Jaden Jackson's gone for 65 yards and all of a sudden it just takes two catches and he's at the number. Yeah. I haven't got there yet. So, but this is probably going to be my answer. This is the type of game where someone's going to have like two catches for 90 yards. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I could see that happening. And plus you got defenders that'll be slipping all over the place. If the rain is as, as real as it seems like it might be on Saturday. We're saying it could hold off into the second half, maybe. Okay. We'll see. Well, all right. Second half is when the cats strike, just like sharks waiting waiting in the water there. Uh, defensively for K-State, what can they be successful against Houston with? Because Houston is going to challenge them in the space that even though they've been better secondary-wise, it's still the shakiest part of this defense. So Donovan Smith – in a regular setting would put the ball in the air a lot. Maybe the weather changes it. I kind of doubt it because that's just what Houston does. So, I mean, what, what should we expect on that front? Yeah, it's going to be Donovan's game. Uh, I mean, it would be stupid for Houston to try to win another way because they can't. Donovan Smith's their dude. They get, excuse me. They got to let him go and kind of be him. Um, if they don't, then that'll play into the Kansas State's hands because guess what? Kansas State, they can run the crap out of the ball. But they they also stopped the run. Um, they're what they face six of the top twenty eight rushers in the country already, and are giving up less than four yards per carry, which I think is number twenty two in the country, or or less than one hundred twenty yards a game might might have been it. Um, don't have the exact details there. I, I kind of forget them, but it's it's along those lines. Really good run defense. Look, they're probably going to give up some chunks in the passing game. Everybody will to Houston. What Kansas State is really good at, and the only team that is better than them at this is Michigan um, by a lot. Um, you, you make your own conclusions on why. But <laughs> Kansas State red zone, the touchdown percentage allowed is like 30%, I think, only. Mm-hmm. It's number two in the country. The, literally the only team better at them is Michigan, who is still at 11%. Peters. 11%. So Michigan is 20% better than everybody else. I don't know how that happens, but Kansas State's number two in the country. So, you know, Houston can have their yards if they still clamp up in the red zone, and Kansas State has this year. Also, last game, the third down disparity was big. I think Kansas State's a top 15 offense on third down and a top 20 defense on third down. They were 10 of 13 on third down against TCU. The Frogs on the other side, 2 of 13. Yeah, no, that's uh, that was that was very noticeable when you look at the box score and how it plays out. K State right now is seventh in the country uh, in third down conversion percentage. Uh, they are at fifty two point six percent. The only teams better than them, UNLV is sixth at fifty three. Watch out for those rebels. Yeah, Oregon fifty three point one, KU fifty three point four, Michigan fifty six and a half, and then Georgia fifty seven point one, LSU fifty seven point eight. So, I mean, K-State is in pretty elite company, and there's only 13 teams in the country that are 50% or better on third down on third down conversions this year offensively. It helps probably 
to have the QB run game. I think, and, and yeah, and, and and especially with the way Kansas State runs the ball, if you get into manageable third downs, yeah, yeah, and K State is uh, holding opponents to exactly thirty percent on defense uh, with the third down conversions. The only teams better than them, most of them would make sense: Georgia, Utah, Penn State, Oklahoma, Texas. Um, some of the others in there it would maybe surprise you. NC State is third in the country uh, on their third down defense, but. That's just some stuff to note going There's Something into. that's a little surprising too is how good that Kansas State is on third down because in the only way I, the only reason I say this obviously they went ten to thirteen last week they're really good on third down but it's, it felt like that's what hurt them against Missouri to be quite honest and what's weird about it is if you look back like it wasn't necessarily that they were bad on third down against Mizzou because I thought the same thing coming out of it but the way it breaks down it was just. They gave up some like major back-breaking plays on third down and like ones that were crucial in the game where it's like, okay, get this stop here and that's big. Well, and they couldn't like the very the, yeah. the very first drive of the game, they had Missouri on a third down. Yeah, and yeah, Missouri yeah. popped off a big one. And like you think, man, K Sarah got that touchdown, it changes this. So there was a lot in that game. And offensively, they struggled in that game to, to pick up. I, I, I was talking about, yeah, and, and obviously going back. I was actually talking about offense because oh, it seemed yeah. like they bring in Avery Johnson on second and long. He'd get him into a third and mm-hmm. short situation, and they'd take him off the field and they wouldn't convert. Yeah, and they had to settle for some field goals in that game that at this point, the offense is playing like we wouldn't expect them to settle for field goals. So Yeah, and, and really was now looking back on it too, the only game where Chris Tennant really laid an egg. I think, right? Was that his misses? He did have – he had the one miss in that game that was like uh, – oh, it was a sizable kick, kick short. but yeah. it left it pretty short. Um, there was another game. Did he UCF? miss a kick against UCF? That or I think, Oklahoma State. I can't remember now. There, Look, Chris Tennant has turned things around. I have not had to worry about him in, in a couple of weeks, so – are, are you confident, comfortable, like everything is just a foregone conclusion? Are you to that stage of it? I How I feel about Chris Tennant right now is how I felt about Will Howard last season, where he, he started to play so well and stack him up that I, I was not thinking going into games or in certain moments that I had a lack of confidence or uh, it's going to hit the fan again at some point. I never had that feeling. I probably probably – once Will got into that game against Baylor and just was letting it rock and everything was going fine, everything that I thought about Will Howard the last two years, they were officially gone. I was no longer waiting for the shoe to fall. I thought, this is the dude. He's ready to go. Chris Tennant is the same way right now, where I'm not worried about it, but the second something starts to go wrong, I will be able to immediately slide back into. You'll, you'll go right back to that uh, dark place. Like, like, on, like I – well, like it was easy to do for everybody when Will Howard started struggling this year, where we had two years to tell us that Will Howard was not a good quarterback. And then he had uh, seven games last year where he was awesome. And he told us, I am a, I am a real quarterback. I am a good quarterback. And, but it was so easy for everybody because most of your experiences with Will Howard, even to this point, have still been bad, that when things started to go south, it was just like riding a bike. You're like, oh, yep, this guy stinks. He can't cut it. And Chris Tennant, it, it would be the same way. Where right now, he steps up there to kick. The last couple of weeks, I haven't even thought about it when he's gone up there. I've just been like, oh, yeah, he knocked the, the kick through. But if he I'll, misses I'll like, like two of them against Houston, I'm going to be like, yep, he's done. He's cooked. Get him out of here. On to the next. Like, that's where I'm going to be at. And that's just un- – it's unfair in some ways. But also, again, I've said it a lot today, but there's a reason for it. That is just how sports works, where you're good until you're not. And right now, Chris Tennant is good. And I will continue to believe that he will be good until he's not. Yeah, and it's college sports, especially in, in probably more frequent college sports, just because you are dealing with a younger individual. Like you're not dealing with a 30 year old man; you're dealing with a 20, 21 year old that is affected by everything that is going on in his life. And I'm not excusing anything, but like confidence, easily more shaken in a kid this age. It's also easily more weaponized in a positive way in a kid this age. Yeah, that's very true. Very, very true. All right, let's roll on now. And uh, before we get into a little bit more of our preview for this weekend, we'll shift into uh, America's favorite segment that we do on this show. It is time for a little best bets action. And uh, for this week, 
Yeah, we got to acknowledge yeah. D.Y. went 3-0 and last week. It was a good showing for him. Iowa screwed me. Did the refs screw me? I don't know. I Look, if it wasn't Iowa and I had not picked them, I probably would tell you, you know what, they probably made the right call. But <laughs> instead, I would have won that sucker if uh, they let Iowa return that punt. So I'm going to say that we got screwed. Us Hawkeyes, the world's out to get us, you know. Just because our offense sucks doesn't mean our team has to suck. There, the Tiger Hawk. That's what they Thank call you. it. Tiger why is Hawk. it called? Why is it called the Tiger Hawk? It does. It doesn't well, look I don't like. Know. Ask, Bill, ask Bill Snyder. He would know, right? Mm, probably. Yeah, he would tell like me. That. You know, he'd tell you to write the hell what you want to write about it or something. Uh, I mean, it, look, it's a fine looking bird. Uh, I grew up fine looking in, bird. in high school. One of my better friends was an Iowa fan, so. It's it's just like riding a bike, uh, and you know, doubting Will Howard or Chris Tennant. It's easy for me to talk shit on Iowa because it's like riding a bike back to my. I, I will say it's funny that I went three and zero in our best bets because they might have been the only bets I won last week. <laughs> yeah, it was the did. first. Yeah, it was the first week where I didn't win anybody. Yeah. yeah, you did say that. You're like, well, but at least publicly you look great last week. <laughs> Privately, not so good. All right, best bets for this week. Uh, a lot of Big Twelve emphasis here. We got to start with this though. Houston over 20 and a half. How dare you? Uh, hey, you've been talking it up. They have a good offense. This is a little bit of a letdown spot for Kansas State. And I think they win comfortably, spoiler alert. But uh, I think they do so with Houston scoring some points. Because Look, I love the way the Kansas State defense is trending. They're really growing as a unit. But you don't get fixed overnight. You still have some hiccups along the way. This could be one of them. Did you just – Joe Klanderman walked into the press conference on Thursday and you just said, hey, Joe, think your defense still sucks, so don't get too big for your britches. Houston, no. 21 points on you this weekend. No, no, I didn't. How about the Pokes? Under 30 and a half, right? I'm doing team totals this week. That's against the Cincinnati Bearcats. Look, I, I don't know how many teams Oklahoma State can score 31 on, and they're also in a comeback down to earth spot at some point. I believe. Well, I can tell you this much. Uh, Oklahoma State can score at least 31 on Kansas and West Virginia, and those are the only teams that they've done it against this year. Uh, they came, they were two points shy against K State, and but I think I think that's a good one because Cincinnati, boy, they make some the games look they make and some they games look really them. disgusting. Guess what? Cincinnati is number one in the Big Twelve at rush defense. Guess what Oklahoma State has to do to be successful in offense? Yeah, Ollie Gordon's got to go for a billion yards. Yes, and Cincinnati is the best in the Big 12 for some reason. I don't get it at stopping <laughs> the run. Well, so Everybody's got to be good at something, and for Cincinnati, it's not quarterback, so it's got to be run defense or something. It was funny. I think it was on the Three Mall podcast or maybe our Patreon podcast. We were talking about which game is more trappy or – which game is more simpler, like an easier win for Kansas State this year? Houston at home or Baylor at home? Ultimately, I said Baylor because of the time that's coming is a little bit more difficult because it's right after the Texas game, and I think Kansas State's getting Houston at the right time. But Cole Manback from the Three Mile Podcast made a good point. At least Houston is good at something. They're good at offense. Yes. They can score. Baylor is good at nothing. Yeah, So that's true. When, when you said – well, at least Cincinnati's good at something. Hey, they are good at something, but literally Baylor is good at nothing. And that's why Cincinnati, it's Cincinnati's not gotten blown out in any game they've played. They played this with year. Oklahoma. Yeah. 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 And like they're a quarterback not named Emory Jones away from not being bad. I, I, is think. that the worst quarterback in the Big 12? I think it has to be at this point. Even Slovis is up there. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, my apologies it's to Alan Bowman. Team. <laughs> You're back in Keaton Slovis too. I see it. Yeah. Well, uh, am I back in Keaton Slovis or am, am I backing something else? I've got I've got theories, as people know. We'll get into that in, in a second. Uh, you also have OU minus ten. I think that's a good one. I even I even saw recently it's down to nine and a half now. So that's think, that's even more beneficial. <laughs> but I'm I I see where you're going with this, and I like it. I think last game. Last week woke OU up. Now maybe KU plays the game out of their mind a little bit because Big Noon's there and they're trying to pump it up a little bit. But, man, look, Jason Bean is not a terrible quarterback. But when it comes down to the time where you need him the most, he's not there. No. And, look, Oklahoma's better, more than 10 points better than Kansas, I think, with Jason Bean at quarterback. It just depends 
what Oklahoma is going to show up. And I imagine the good one shows up after, you know, escaping UCF by two points last week. If, uh, if, if, if Oklahoma doesn't, if they don't cover that, yeah, then they're going to have trouble the rest of the year. So last year, Jason Bean made the start in Norman. KU lost by 10. That was a better KU team, I, I think, again, at the time against a worse Oklahoma team. And so now you are trying to translate. I think it works. And look, there's a reason why this guy's named Jason Bean. He's got beans for brains when it comes to late game situations because yeah. there's just nothing going on up there with some of the decisions he makes. He's like fine. He's fine up until that point. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. He, he and Jalen Daniels, they can produce at the same level in the Kansas offense for the first three quarters of a game. And then Jason Bean's like, I got three really stupid plays in me, and I'm going to use them at the worst times for you. And Jalen Daniels, to his credit, he just doesn't do that. That's why he is the better quarterback and why he makes KU a more lethal team. It's because Jason Bean is going to make those errors at some point. Jalen Daniels very rarely is going to make unforced errors for KU. I agree. And look, I'll say this, and I kind of put it on our board too. The the word is out that Jalen Daniels might have played his last game in a KU uniform. I don't the whispers. I'm not saying it's a hundred percent fact because I, I'm not like a KU whisperer here, but there's a non-zero chance that he's done at KU. Yeah, you're not a scoops meister, D Y. No, 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 not there. All right, uh, my best bets for the week. I'm taking DJ Giddens two touchdowns in the game. Ooh. I mean, he look, and it, the reason I'm doing this also is the value on it. He's like plus four something for it. Treshawn Ward actually has the highest odds for K State this week of getting two touchdowns in the game, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, I guess maybe because you look at him as more of the guy that can do damage when catching the football. But DJ Giddens has scored on some big pass plays this year, and those are kind of the, the plays that I've alluded to already that I think could play out in this game that mess with our receiving leader number that drew setting over unders and i just think like k-state's gonna get down there you give it to a guy that you know has no problem just rolling through guys going straight up the gut and can score when you know everything's wet and nasty so i'm going dj giddens two touchdowns it's a, a little bit on a limb but you know what like i'm sick of picking overs in the first quarter or the first half or you know stuff that barely doesn't work out because i expected a different outcome so just give me dj giddens two touchdowns in the game uh, he's been awesome lately, so I, I would expect to to continue. I like it. All right. Uh, Washington over 43 and a half. Look, D.Y. was all over them being dog crap last week. And I am, I am going the other way. We got to alternate. Every other week, we're going to hype Washington up. And the weeks that we don't, we're going to build them down on this uh, podcast. This is what we do on the KSS show. We victimize teams. We did yeah. that to – I think we did that to Pittsburgh the last two weeks. Now yeah. it's Washington stir. Here's the deal. Looking at Stanford this season, they've given up a hefty amount of points to some teams. Gave up 24 to Hawaii, which, ugh, Hawaii. USC scored 56 on them. They gave up 30 to Sacramento State. I mean, they lost to an FCS school. They gave up 42 to Oregon. Everybody remembers that they gave up 40, 43 to Colorado in that win. They gave up 42 to UCLA. Washington is easily the best offense they're going to face this year, better than USC's in my opinion. And Washington, very similar to Oklahoma, had their wake-up call and is probably looking to prove something this week. I think Washington just tears them up. Now, I'm not ruling out that Stanford can't hang around in this game and maybe keep up with Washington in some ways because Stanford has shown a little bit of a competitive streak at times this season. But I think Washington gets to their over this year. I, I bet Washington scores – like 45, 49 points this weekend. I, I don't think you're wrong, but I, I also think you're right as well. Like for some reason, like Stanford, they lose a lot of games this year. Yeah. But they cover a lot. The total in the game is 60 and a half, by the way. So that's also one that would not be the most out there to do. All right. This is the one you already noticed at DY. You talk crap on my boy, Keaton Slovis already. I am taking the BYU Cougars plus 18 and a half in Austin this weekend. And everybody's probably thinking, well, it's because there's no Quinn Ewers, backup quarterback for Texas, first career start situation, all this. Or maybe you're, you're really optimistic and you think that Texas is looking ahead to K-State next week already. No, big game. Texas, it's their Super Bowl. 
the big brand of K-State coming to town. They got nothing else to play for this season but trying to beat K-State like every other team in this league. It's for none of those reasons. It is because there is a man by the name of Steve Sarkeesian. And as much as I think Steve Sarkeesian is a fraud, not as fraudulent as Dave Aranda, but still a fraud, probably not going to do much at Texas like people want him to, although he's having a fine year, whatever. Do you know where Steve Sarkeesian went to school, D.Y.? Brigham Young University. No relation, by the way. No relation. Uh, yes, to none, none to Brigham Young for DY. No, uh, no he's... more, no Mormons in my family. Sorry. Okay. Well, I'm glad we got that out of there. But yes, he went to Brigham Young. You know my theory on this, DY. I've shared it with the world many times. There are just some guys out there that they see their school and something goes off in the back of their head. I think it's subliminal. I don't think they are intentionally doing it, but they have this thought and this message that appears and it's man, I love that place. I owe my life to that place. I can't, I can't beat up on them. Bill Self does this every like three games against Oklahoma State. I mean, you look at who has had the most success in the Big 12 in terms of beating Bill Self since he came to Kansas. It is Oklahoma State. And there have been far better teams in the Big 12 since Bill Self got to KU than Oklahoma State. But somehow, some way, no matter the coach, the Cowboys are finding ways to beat the Jayhawks when they shouldn't. And that is because Bill Self loves his alma mater. So I am going with the Bill Self rule this week. And so BYU, BYU outright. No, 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 no. BYU, no, not, not outright. But BYU covers because Steve Sarkeesian does not want to beat up on his, on his Brigham Young boys this weekend. So the Cougars will get the cover solely because Steve Sarkeesian is a nice guy that loves his alma mater. Okay. Well, for that reason, let's never schedule North Dakota State. Well, he, you mean Northern Iowa? Oh, well, both. Yeah, both. Might as well keep both of them off of there. Uh, those are like those are probably the only two FCS schools that Chris Kleiman doesn't want to beat by a hundred points. Can't so, be too safe. Can't be too yeah. safe. <laughs> good call. Good call. Yeah, I would. Uh, it's probably ask, a good ask, thing. Ask Iowa State about Northern Iowa. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's just one of those deals where I, I look at it and go, hmm, that's kind of, it's kind of fishy. How, how does that work out every year? You know, Bill Self's playing one too tight with Oklahoma state. So by the way, I got a North Dakota state helmet now. Yeah. Oh, what a, yeah. what a banderer. I got to support Chris Kleiman and the boys. He will love me now. Yeah. Well now. Yeah. Thank goodness. I'm, now I'm sure he's watching this show. I don't know. I tried to build up some goodwill for us last week when I came back up to the, the press box after we recorded our video on the field after the game. He was up there talking to, to Wyatt. They just recorded the TV show. Uh, yeah, that little, little how the sausage is made for you people. Uh, the Chris Kleiman TV show it does not happen in the middle of the week when you're actually getting to watch it. It happens on Saturday night after the game. So <laughs> Midnight, they are up there in the West Stadium Center recording the Bill, uh, not the Bill Snyder show anymore, uh, the Chris Kleiman <laughs> show. I, I, that's what they should have just kept it called the Bill Snyder. Because also they were not the Bill Snyder show. They were not doing in that studio that was there. Uh, I know for a fact they were still recording it in Dole Hall throughout the throughout its entirety. But yes, I went up and I saw him. He's sitting there, standing there talking to Wyatt. And you know me, I like golf. I like the cats. I like all that stuff. I like Tiger Woods. Chris Kleiman is wearing a nice, like, purple Tiger Woods golf shirt. And I'm just like, oh, I'm blown away. I'm stunned. I love the shirt. And I just said to him, I was like, that is an awesome shirt. And he gave a little laugh and, you know, had, had a chuckle there with me, which is much better than the reaction that he gave me two years ago at Big 12 Media Day when I asked him if he was a fan of the McRib at McDonald's. So, I, you know. Not a fan. Not a fan. No, not a fan. Uh, he doesn't strike me as a guy that eats fast food. Gene Taylor, though, strikes me as a guy that likes the McRib. Based off of his reaction to the question. Yeah. Bud Light McRib and guy. McRib. Put it together. Yeah. yeah. That's all That's all good stuff. All right. Let's get back in to the Cats and the Cougs. Game MVPs. If the Cats get the victory on Saturday, who is going to be the person that shines the brightest on both sides of the ball? Yeah, it's really hard. Uh, yours has to be DJ Gins. You think he's scoring <laughs> twice. So yeah, I guess it does. <laughs> So you don't have an out there. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm, I can't really hide from what I think is going to happen. So, yeah, DJ Giddens, give me a big DJ Giddens game again. I will go. How about this? I'll pander more. Avery Johnson. 
because it's the run game. They got to run the ball. You got to run the ball. I think multiple touchdowns, 100 rushing yards, Avery Johnson. Okay. All right. Well, look, I'm not going to tell you, like, I don't want that to happen. That would be awesome. That would be fun. Uh, defensively for K-State, I, you know, it's tough and it's weird how the defense is playing. I think they're starting to play a lot better right now, but I don't know that, like, anybody is – putting together performances that just like stand out in some massive big way. Um, I think they're all just kind of doing it together and getting better. But I, I said this earlier in the week. I don't know if I said it on Sunday or Monday, whenever, but I'm confident in it. I'm going to go with Marquis Siegel for the sole reason of, I think he gets his first interception as a wildcat this weekend. He is in back-to-back weeks, had interceptions go through his hands. Pick sixes. Which I also have to say, it's weird of me to pick this considering it's going to be wet and the situation where a ball might go through your hands more likely is when it's wet. But screw logic, I am taking Marquis Siegel because he should have had one the last two weeks at some point. He didn't. So this is the week it finally happens. And Donovan Smith's going to put it in the air a ton and take some chances. So the opportunity will be there. Not even a pick. It was pick sixes that he dropped yeah. both on both occasions. I'm going to go Jay Clifton. I think he's getting more and more comfortable. Played a really good game last week. I think he's only going to get better. All right, there you go. Uh, score prediction for it. We know Houston is scoring at least 21 points. So how much do the Cats score, and how do they do it on Saturday? Yeah, it would be funny if I like set a score that was different than that or just contradicted it. <laughs> You're no, like, I got, I got K-State 37, Houston 20. It's like, how? Houston's not going. 37 to zero, actually. No, <laughs> 41-23 Cats, I think. But look, I, I think Houston finds some explosive plays in the passing game and gets some points on the board but I don't think they ever really stopped Kansas State's offense. So that's just the way it goes. And, you know, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at the passing game and you look at the weather, you kind of wonder maybe you can get some explosive plays in the passing game if you're Kansas State, but I think they'll be run heavy. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's all probably a, a fair assessment and, and way to look at it. I, I think I, I am going to lean – you know, I don't know if Houston gets to your 21. I – I, when I saw that, I was a little shocked. And I look, I you know me, I talk up the Houston offense. As some people in the YouTube comments know, I loved up Houston's tall receivers. Uh, at you one love, point, you love year. Red Bull. You love Red Bull. <laughs> I've never had a Red Bull in my life. Uh, I'm not an energy drink guy. I never touched them. That's uh, when I used to do morning radio. We'd have people come in and like, oh, you got coffee in there? So, you know, I'd have like my big like 32 ounce Yeti or whatever. I was like, no, just straight water. And it's you know six in the morning. It's like, that's just how I've always been. Uh, I think Houston gets close to that, and I am going to take Houston with 20 points in the game. So I think K-State wins 41-20. to 20. K-State's obviously going to use the run game. I mean, Drew set the number pretty high on, like, total rushing yards this week. I think they go over it again. Um, K-State could be in the position where we're looking at the quarterbacks combining for, like, 140, 150, and the running backs combining for – 160 plus. I think K State's over 300 rushing yards again, and I think that they have a pretty good time doing it. So give me the Cats 41 to 20 over Houston this weekend. 41 20. So you're, you're you're saying I'm going to lose my bet by half a point. Yeah. And, you know, hey, tough. It's just how it goes. Uh, all right. Let's move on. Finish things off with the Big 12 scoreboard for this weekend. This is the final weekend that there are bye weeks going on. So TCU not playing. Texas Tech not playing, probably good for both of those guys to just sit back this weekend and, and re- rethink and reconsider life. No comment on, on TCU, Texas Tech, reconsidering it, it, life. It's, it's a good thing they're not playing. Yeah. It would not be, it would probably not be good. Although, I don't know. Which, I mean, which team do you think would come out better after last week's game? Probably TCU. Just because I think that, like, obviously there's still life in their season, and they're probably looking at it like, man, that was just not good. We need to play immediately. Texas Tech probably needs to really gear up for this final stretch because it's going to be pretty nasty for them. They're not going to make a bull. No, they won't. Uh, all right, here, here we go. A look at the Big 12 games this weekend. Obviously, K State, Houston at 11. Oklahoma and KU at 11 on Fox. A little big noon kickoff action Boomer. in Lawrence. Although, the big noon crew calling the game 
they are not going to be there. They are going. They are doing Oregon Utah this weekend. So no Gus and Joel. So I assume that it's pro- they probably send like Benetti and Heward to do that game. Uh, one other 11 a.m. game: West Virginia at UCF. Obviously, we've talked a lot about K State and Houston this week, and you like Oklahoma this week, and so do I. What do you expect out of that game? Sellout crowd in Lawrence. They sold it out. They finally did it, guys. So uh, you know, round of applause. Boomer. Yeah, I just one more. Boomer. Boomer big. West Virginia UCF would not be shocked at the Knights won. Yeah, I th- I think UCF wins. Good luck for all you Big 12 folks out there trying to pull a fast one because they've been like touchdown favorites all week. Uh, so that's just one of those where – and then, you know, you're, you're going to look at it if UCF loses and West Virginia's won. You're like, man, that was like some easy free money right there. Like why did we think the team that's been better all season was going to magically be worse? But – UCF's a different team with John Rice Plumley. I think they're a team that looks to kind of galvanize with how things have gone. They still have, what, a, like a sliver of hope to be a bull team this year because they won all their non-conference games. So they are sitting at three and four. They've got games with West Virginia, Cincinnati, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech, and Houston left. Like the schedule is favorable enough for them. Um, and that can all start with this weekend against West Virginia. You win this one, you feel like you can still have a somewhat successful season, and I think they get the job done. I, West Virginia is going to start showing their true colors a little bit more, and obviously the teams that they've beat, they're not the most impressive uh, based on now what we've seen out of them. So give me the uh, the Knights in that one as well. Charge on. Charge on. And ride your Pegasus to, to win. All right, 230 games, just two of them this week. BYU at Texas. Everybody knows my thoughts there. Look, Steve Sarkeesian, he's gonna he's gonna give it up. He's gonna he's going to just say, man, I, I love the Cougs. Uh, yeah. He's gonna look he's gonna look at his boy Kalani Sataki and go. And not to mention that Malik Murphy is going to have to play at quarterback, who was awesome in the spring. But let's see how he looks in a game. I have a bet on this game too, but it doesn't contradict your BYU plus eighteen and a half, so that can still happen. I have BYU under 14 and a half. Texas defense is really good. I don't like BYU's offense. All right. No, I like that. I 31 14 game. I can see it happening. Yeah. I like I like BYU under 14 and a half. Okay. Perfect. I can do that. I'll do both of those. I bet if I bet if I take BYU plus the points and under their total, I give you a nice little little parlay. odds there. Same so. game parlay. Do it. Uh Iowa State Baylor. I wrote about it this week for our, our Big 12 rankings, but how this is going to turn out, the outcome of this game is going to say more about Iowa State than it will Baylor. If Baylor wins this game, it just shows that the Iowa State downfall this season is about to happen, that you know how they've played recently. It's not necessarily indicative of what they will be in the future, but if they win, they keep you know the hope alive, and it just sinks Baylor even more than what's already happened this year. This is the second week in a row that Baylor is just playing a nasty game that nobody should want to watch on ESPN+. Plus. But I will be tuning in and watching as much as I can because I love ugly, bad Big 12 football. That's that's what the Big 12 really is to me, bad teams playing in the middle of the afternoon on a fall Saturday. So I look forward to this. Uh, do you have any grand thoughts on the Bears and Clones in Waco? Baylor is going to win. Oh, okay. All right. There we go. Uh, a Baylor prediction from DY. And then the nightcap in the Big 12. This is, uh, we talked about it briefly because you've got Oklahoma State under 30 and a half. What do you think of Oklahoma State and Cincinnati? The, I mean, the Cowboys are hot. People are talking. They got to get yeah. this win and they could have a massive showdown with Oklahoma and Bedlam next week. I think the Pokes win, but it's a low scoring affair and they get scared a little bit. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm w- I'm with you. I-, I think it's going to be one of those where they'll win because they're at home and-, and they're playing very well right now, and Cincinnati doesn't have the offense. But Cincinnati hangs around with a lot of these teams, and they can make it uncomfortable and they can make it ugly. And Oklahoma State, even though they've been winning, they have shown that they can have some ugliness in it. Like that K-State O-State game, it was a great win for Oklahoma State. It was not a great performance. They were ugly. They were ugly. But we'll see how it goes. Uh Predictions right now, because there are going to be three possible just massive Big 12 games next weekend, and Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, could we see like 
the 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 royal red carpet rolled out for those teams like is bedlam going to get game day what what's your projection for like some tv slots next week because that's been the rage of our speculation recently yeah, I, I, I'm, on a six really day intrigued. Period. I'm intrigued <laughs> someone's going to bedlam it's the last one oklahoma state has to win i think mm-hmm. which i don't think is a guarantee yeah i think oklahoma winning is a guarantee but if they both win Either game day or big noon, one's going to Bethlehem. I'm not sure which one it is. Uh, does somebody go to Texas? I don't know. I don't think game day would go to Texas. Maybe in a perfect world for the Big 12, and maybe it would be an, actually a disastrous world because they could both lose. Yeah. And your outgoing schools win. But you have game day going to Bethlehem and big noon going to Austin. Yeah. I think that would that'd probably be what the league would want right now. Give you the, yeah. the massive exposure and see how it goes. Um, we know that the whoever gets the ABC game, it's going to be two thirty, um, in in all likelihood, because the that slot's already spoken for. They're still going to go to USC Washington uh, for the their Saturday night game next week. But Big Noon is in play, eleven a.m. on Fox, and then the the marquee slot on ABC. Hey, and don't write out KU Iowa State next week. And if both of those teams win, you're looking at a, a game that has some implications uh, in terms of of the Big Twelve. So. Uh, we'll we'll just have to see how it plays out and goes from there. But that's uh, everything that we have to look forward to next weekend. To get there, though, K-State and a number of others have to take care of business this weekend against what could be serious hiccups ahead of massive matchups in Week 10 of the Big 12. So that will do it for Derek and I, and we will be back on Sunday with the KSO Show. Myself, Drew Galloway, KSU underscore fan, as we recap the Cats and the Cougs, then DY and I on Monday taking you through the week. Make sure you're locked into all the content throughout the weekend at K-State Online on On3 because obviously football is massive right now, but the biggest note of all, possibly, Patrick Ngongba, the big-time center recruit, is in the house, his official visit, the last visit he's making before he makes his decision uh, next weekend. So that is huge for K-State needing a good showing and get him over the hump to beat out the likes of Duke and Kentucky for his services. So we'll have a I'm sure a lot more on that uh, over the course of next week when we can, can maybe get a little bit of an idea of how the visit went and where things are leaning. So basketball, football recruiting, all very hot. And then obviously K-State football still trying to get themselves back to Arlington. So for Derek Young, I am Mason Voth. Thank you for watching the KSO show. Keep staying locked into everything we have going on at K-State Online.